25 lat Macolab. 25 lat rewolucji cyfrowej. Przed Państwem Denis Wisnowski. Witam Piaciu Makalabu. Mieszkam, mieszkam w Chicago, i prezydent Obama był bardzo kind to be my warm-up act here this week. He talked about kielbasa in Chicago. What he didn't say is that there's a holiday in Chicago. There's one for presidents. There's Fourth of July, Thanksgiving, Christmas, and There's Martin Luther King Day, and there's also Kazimierz Pulaski Day. The kids get off school on that day, not for any other ethnic but him. I'm very proud to be, uh, have chosen Chicago. I feel as home there as a Pole as I do here in this lovely city. This story has three parts, the crisis, the way ahead, and crossing the chasm. I'm going to explain all three of these things. The first, a little bit of a bedtime story. Once upon a time, there were no standard definitions of financial terms and the financial institutions could interpret the meaning of the rules and regula regulations of the industry each in their own way. Every day, new financial instruments and transaction types were invented. One day, major companies and business for many decades began to collapse and lead the world into general economic depression. Because of that, regulators struggled mightily to understand the condition of the world's economy, and it became clear that the companies themselves did not know their true financial exposure. They did not know the provenance, which is the truth, of the data. Because of that, an effort was launched by the industry to develop a financial industry business ontology called FIBO, a common vocabulary based upon international standards that would enable companies to better communicate within and among themselves and would enable regulators to perform meaningful oversight as required by laws. Until finally, with FIBO, the dual purpose of reducing the cost of manufacturing data, that's what it's called in banks, required by law became de minimis, very small, and Congress and regulators were confident of the provenance of the answers to their questions. FIBO is a product of the Enterprise Data Management Council, which is 130 companies worldwide in the financial industry and from their service companies such as Make a Lab. I'm going to go back in a bit of the history now and talk about the digital evolution in banking. 1950s, uh, SRI, Standard Research Institute, invented the first computer solely designed for financial transactions. It was used for the remainder of that decade. IBM invented the 1401 in the 1960s and began immediately used by banks, and the first ATMs came out. By 1970, there were about 3,000 ATMs in the United States. They're beginning to look like the ATMs that we have today. 1970s brought many competitors to this industry. They were known as the bunch, Burroughs, Univac, NCR, CDC, Honeywell, there were some other ones. And all those companies are gone now from making computers except for IBM. Many computer companies were Digital Equipment Corporation, also gone, and others. And most importantly for today, the ARPANET, which was an invention of the Department of Defense. In fact, I was with DOD during the 70s, during the time that that was occurring. I say 1980s began what we call game on. 1980s had enough computer power to demand a new way of managing data relational databases, columns and tables that could handle millions of bytes of data without having a problem in those days. Microcomputers, microcomputers begat microprocessors. The Ethernet, which was a way of implementing the ARPANET, which became the internet. All that happened in the 1980s. It happened so fast, and there was so much promise that the World Wide Web was developed from some articles written by Tim, Tim Berners-Lee and others, and it led to, in, 19, in 2000, the, dot, the dot com bubble. There was an act that was very important for, that, for the financial industry called the repeal of the Glass-Steagall Steagall, uh, Act. What that did was separate retail from, from, from commercial, retail from wholesale and banks, a very bad thing as it turned out to do, to be. The 21st century, we have cloud computing, ability to talk to anybody, anytime, anywhere, with voice and with digital, and we do that. And the semantic web, which is called Web 3.0, which I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be talking about mostly here this evening. So 2000, the dot-com bubble burst. I think that the Make-A-Lab people were very prescient at that time to start, just at the time when things would have to continue to go up. Sarbanes-Oxley was a response of the regulators, U.S. and worldwide, 
to the dot-com bubble. That was a good thing to do, we thought, but it didn't stop the biggest financial crisis of the 20th and the 21st century, the Great Recession, the global financial crisis of 2008. So what have we learned? There are a lot of words on these slides, and I don't like to read the words on slides or, or to have the translator be uh, overburdened. So what have we learned? Many causes. No one can actually agree on these causes. So there are many questions about what really happened. What do we see when we look at a picture like this? We see the same thing that the regulators saw and the bankers saw when they looked at the data in hindsight. Fact is that nobody had a clue. No good idea of what really happened and what to do about it next. So what do regulators do? What do bankers do? They had these caustic loans coming in to their banks, and they had no place to sell them anymore. That's what really happened. So the losses widened, and we had to have many, many, many bailouts around the world. So the supervisors responded. We call them regulators. You call them supervisors here. So he says, hmm, a systemic crisis could harm the bank I supervise. I should watch for signs of one. So what do I do? I make demands of the bank. We call these demands Dodd-Frank, a regulation that is 10 times the size of Sarbanes-Oxley, 10 times. And the Volcker Rule, which went into play last December, that has to do with specifically with, with uh, being able to uh, monitor risk one by one. So the industry is not happy about this. They see all of these rules. A, a page of a law changes into 10 pages of rules. That's how it works. So the industry talks about the cost of managing all of this data. 150 million to 350 million depend upon the size of the company. And those are the substantial companies. Many of the small banks simply can't do this. They have to be acquired by other banks, both in the United States and in Europe. Another report, and I always give references for my, my, my slides, said that there's no business value to this data. As a business person, I take offense to that. I want to find business value for all the data, even though I have to give it to the government. I also understand, having spent uh, five years as CTO of the Department of Defense, that we have to have a strong defense, but without a strong financial system, that can't happen. So the industry had to figure out a better way of managing this data while complying with the laws. So what's the solution? Adopt 21st century data management principles and technology. A common vocabulary, that's what semantics are, no more complicated than that, so we can understand what we're saying when we talk to one another. The Office of Financial Research took a hard look at FIBO, the Financial Institute of Business Ontology, and said we should be looking at how FIBO could become the basis for the common vocabulary. Basil, right here, said there is, this is last year, says there's a need for an intelligent semantic network for, for systemic risk analysis. So the idea is to reach back in to the financial institutions without messing up how they want to do business to get the answers to the questions that I have a right to ask, just like in my little story that I had at the beginning of this talk. So what is a common vocabulary? This is fairly easy to see, common vocabulary. This person in desperation labeled shirt, the dog, the cat, the house, the door. Okay, so that's a little bit funny, but in some things that aren't so funny, they're deadly serious in our lives, aviation. The common vocabulary in aviation, I am a pilot, and if someone says to me, make the, execute the procedure, turn it at the outer marker, it's in English, but if I'm in Mexico, that may not be quite the language, the kind of English that I learned, or other places, or in France, uh, all of which I've said in the, in, in, in the jump seat or in my own airplane in flying. So the common language, it is English, but the meaning of all the terms is exactly the same. So I can get into any airplane, and I can know exactly what to do. The cockpits look the same, and the approach plates look the same. The FDIC wants to be able to do that when they walk into a bank on Friday and demand to see the books because they have to decide whether to close that bank on Monday at 8 o'clock in the morning or not. Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, they're the ones who do that. They have to have a common vocabulary. Oh, there's some other parts of life where we have to do the same kind of thing, like sailing. may not be in a single language, but we know that, that port is port, is starboard is starboard, and forward is forward, and stern is the back. We know those things. So we need a common vocabulary. In this world of the 21st century, we call what delivers this common vocabulary the semantic, a semantic network, just like Basil said, or Web 3.0. I'm going to show it to you in action. 
this is an actual database. If I showed you the traditional relational database, columns and rows, you would have to figure out what all those columns and row means, rows mean and write a program. In this case, this is subject, predicate, object in this data store. Person has a name, that's me. Person owns stock in McDonald's, McDonald's buys land. So I want to answer the question, Dennis Wisnowski, does Dennis Wisnowski own McDonald's stock? Everybody in this room knows the answer to that question without writing a program to do it. You know the answer. The answer is embedded in the data. This is revolutionary. It was developed by DOD because we had to. But does this answer the question, where is this person from? No. You could spend a lot of money and add another row and column to a table and write a program. Or you could look for another data store, these are called triples, that has that information. Person born in Washington, located in Pennsylvania. I hide my age here, we're allowed to do that. Uh, person has name, Dennis Wisnowski. So I know where this person was born. Do I know if this person, looking at that graph, it's called a graph, owns McDonald's stock? No. But it's the same person. So what happens? I can, without writing a program, accept a query, cause the software to go out and find this person and everything about that person in real time. The same way that what you're carrying in your pocket, your Android or your Siri, knows where you are and knows where you're going to be in another half an hour when you're not here anymore. The same way. Now, it's not magic. It takes standards written by W3C, Worldwide Web Consortium, by OMG, Object Management Group, and others, and it takes peer, people with a lot of courage, like the, the Mako Lab people and, and uh, Martin and David and others, to, to preach this gospel and to help people to obey it with real world situations. Now, how this really works, subject, predicate, object. The bottom person has name, that's called the literal, so you know that it's me. These are a tinker toy example, thanks to David McComb, and it can be expanded without limit. That's why it's called a graph. So this graph says, plug those tinker toys together, and you can make a data store that's worldwide, but only pieces of it at a time if you want. Again, just the way the Siri works and that kind of technology, which was also, also came out of the US Department of Defense, the same people who, who originally were part of developing this semantic web technology. So Web 3.0, crossing the chasm. What I'm going to be talking about here is what is the chasm and why this technology is poised to go across it right now. This book was written more than 20 years ago by Jeffrey Moore. He talks about a chasm being when we have a new technology and there's, there are many early adopters, but it hasn't been determined whether the risk-reward ratio is significant enough to, take, to make that investment. So the chasm is crossed when the risk-reward ratio flips. What we find in looking at any technology is that all of the technology follows an S-curve. This is the classical S-curve. So look at the timeline and look at the, the uh, on, on the left-hand side, the goodness of the technology. So introduction, exploitation, saturation, and then replacement. This timeline is inevitably around 30 years, maybe 20, it may be uh, 40, but we think about things like PCs as being new, they're not, those are 1970s. So that's 40-year-old technology to be replaced by laptops and notebooks really quick, that had to happen. And then most of us not even using those, but using our smartphone. So this is when a breakthrough, like a transistor, replaces a 40-year technology called a vacuum tube, integrated circuit quickly follows, put integrated circuits together, you have microprocessors. And that time period to have those things happen is about that 30 years for each technology. So at the top of this, we reach saturation and replacement, we need to look for something else. So the definition is a sufficient body of knowledge and an experience base causes the risk of staying with the old way to be greater than moving to the new. So we have a compelling reason to move on. All innovation follows this pattern. We can look at these other kinds of technologies, televisions, TVs, VCRs, cell phones, or newer things like PCs, DVDs, or tablet computers. They followed that cycle. So what is an innovator to do? What's a company that starts in, in, in 1990 and wants to, wants to stick out, uh, stick around for a long time, do. They look for technologies that are about to cross that chasm. They look for evidence of that technology crossing that chasm. So 
1999, DARPA invents this technology. Tim Berners-Lee, again, 2001 Scientific American article describing the semantic web, Web 3.0, the way that we know it to be today. Somewhere in the 2000s, someone actually used the word. And then the big companies like Oracle and IBM developing, developing uh, software for the marketplace and proving that it works in dramatic ways, like Watson. Smaller companies taking the technology and using it, Google Graphs, Facebook Graphs, and much acquisition activity of these smallest companies. So we know that this technology works. We know we can create these graphs that are shown on the left side of this picture. So the question becomes when to be out with the old and in with the new. For the left side, we have old technologies that are still going to be used for a long time, but the investment will be less and less and less because we get nothing out of that investment, such as point-to-point -point connecting computers. We don't do that anymore. We connect it when we need them, and then that connection goes away. Relational database technology requires armies of programmers. We won't have those programmers like today. The information content is in the data. So here we are at the top of that picture. That's Wojtek sitting up there. I, I didn't get a picture of, of, of Merrick. And uh, so he's up there looking for a new technology. He knows that this old technology has been there for 30 years, and he's looking for what technology started some years before. It's year one, this particular case the 90s with the semantic web technology. So he finds that technology, and then he looks for those examples that I showed in the previous chart for when to jump in. And that's what we've been doing with FIBO. FIBO started in 2008, in this year, and that was 10 years after the technology began. And this year is when it's going public, and we're happy to have uh, Mako Lab being the uh, pioneer in Poland to do this technology. So, uh, Jinkoya, Ibego, Bechulu, thank you very much.